And um, as you heard from my bio, I do have a background with uh, military intelligence. I was a Russian linguist. This is during the height of the Cold War. And I actually have two passions in life, one of which is ufology, which is why I'm the international director of MUFON. Uh, and my other passion, which a lot of folks don't know, is spying, the sp spycraft, or the art of spying. Um, in fact, uh, uh, one of the things that happened to me shortly after I left, in the, mil left the military is when I went to um, get my undergrad degree at Florida State University, I was driving down uh, Pensacola Avenue in Tallahassee, Florida, and this uh, car came up from behind and clipped my right rear bumper. And so we both pulled over, and I got out and went to the back of the car to see what the damage was. And uh, what happened was that the gentleman got out of his car, walked over, and he was staring intently at my chest, and his jaw, job, his jaw dropped, and he started profusely apologizing to me. And as he started the talk, I could detect that he had a Russian accent. And I wondered, why does he look so fearful? And I looked down, and I was wearing my KGP t-shirt. <laughs> It had the KGB emblem, it said Kamitiet Gasudarsonoi Biazapasnasti, which means KGB in Russian, and he was horrified. <laughs> now I assured him that I was just a young, poor college student, that I did not belong to the KGB, uh, that I did have a background in military intelligence, he was very thankful, and uh, we exchanged phone numbers. So that was an interesting story. If I could get my presentation up, thank you. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, Russian espionage and UFOs, the relationship between the two. Now, just to give you a brief history of Russian espionage, up until the end of the Cold War, uh, there were two major organizations that had to do with foreign intelligence, the ones that were actively involved here in the United States. We have all the different variations of the Foreign Intelligence Service, which, uh, which was originally as a Cheka and then became, over the years, a number of different acronyms but eventually became the Soviet KGB. Uh, also active here in the United States was the GRU, which was Soviet intelligence, uh, military intelligence. Um, there are the emblems for both of those organizations. I find the one for the GRU fairly interesting. And I wonder if the uh, citizens of Gotham City ever knew that Bruce Wayne was a GRU agent. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Now, the Russians were very active here in the United States uh, in terms of infiltrating this, co this country, um, and they had a number of notable early achievements, everything from infiltrating the uh, Manhattan Project very thoroughly to infiltrating every aspect of our government from the White House to the Office of Strategic Services to the Treasury Department to the State Department um, and so on, also the armed forces. Now, what happened was that um, we knew that the Russians were active here. We knew because in uh, 1945, there was a Canadian uh, cipher clerk in Canada that defected, Igor Gauzenko, and he let the Canadians know, who then told us, that there were a number of different spy rings operating within the United States. But at the same time, we were actively breaking the Soviet diplomatic code under a project known as the Venona Project. How many of you have heard of the Venona Project? Okay, a lot of you may not have heard of it, because it was only declassified very much later. This was right after, the, during uh, the, the uh, later years of the war and right after the war. The Army Security Agency, which is the predecessor to the National Security Agency, was actively decoding uh, the Soviet diplomatic code. And through that, those decodes, they were able to unmask a number of notable spies. Everyone from the Rosenbergs to uh, the atomic spies, um, and some of the other spy rings that were active at the time. Now, interestingly enough, uh, the Russians had their own mole in the Army Security Agency who told the Russians that we are breaking their code, and once the Russians figured that out, they said, okay, let's change the codes. And that's what they did, and that intelligence dried up. So we have Russian espionage today. Uh, the KGB was disbanded in, uh, I believe it was 1991. It broke up into two separate agencies, the SVR, which is the Foreign Intelligence Agency, which is equivalent to the Central Inte Intelligence Agency, the CIA. Uh, it's interesting that they named their directorates with these different letters, uh, Directorate X, which has to do with scientific and technical intelligence. So if there is any active 
uh, interest on the part of the Russian, uh, Russian intelligence and anything that has to do with our military industrial complex, uh, you can bet it's probably the folks in Directorate X that are behind that. But even though we have the KGB broken up in SVR and FSB, counterintelligence, they pale in comparison to the size of the old GRU, the old Russian military intelligence. There are more Russian military intelligence spies on American soil than there are from the other two agencies. Now, the way Russian agents operate is uh, there are legal agents, those are the folks that uh, are granted diplomatic immunity, they're here supposedly on official business. Um, we also have illegals, these are folks that live among the wider community and they operate as spies covertly. And then probably the more popular are the mercenaries, the folks that are for hire. Now if you guys remember over the past few years, uh, some of these names, John Anthony Walker from the Navy who was convicted of spying, uh, Robert Hansen, who was an FBI mole, and we have Aldrich Ames, which infiltrated the CIA. So they're the more common type. So the big question in relation to UFOs is why would Russian intelligence be interested in the UFO field? Well, it's actually fairly simple. Uh, especially with an organization like MUFON, which can be used as a form of intelligence for these various organizations. Now this was a report that was filed August 3rd of 2007 on the MUFON website. It comes from a gentleman who said that he was on vacation in New Hogan Lake, California, one August afternoon, floating in his boat, and he looked up and he saw this strange aircraft. And he recognized it as probably military, but he didn't really know what type of aircraft it was. It was wedge-shaped in appearance. He was unable to tell how big it was. He could hear some noise, but he was also 60% deaf. And he took a single snapshot, and I'll show you that picture in just a second here, but I wanted to talk about how that the aircraft slowed to a standstill, made a few barrel rolls, accelerated to a speed about the same as when you see an airliner overhead. It was not an F-117 or a B-2. This gentleman obviously knew something about military aircraft because he had even recognized prior other aircraft like the Boeing Bird of Prey. And he said, okay, well I think I'm calling this a UFO even though it's not extraterrestrial, I think it's probably military. And this is the photo he submitted. Now, interestingly enough, the MUFON investigator that took on this case also works in the defense industry for a major aerospace contractor and he recognized right away what that craft was. He recognized it as a classified military vehicle commonly called the XOV which is actually a two-stage to orbit transport. So we have this larger uh, plane here that takes the smaller vehicle up to uh, a very high altitude and then launches it into orbit. 